Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for coming to this talk. So my name is Anupam Jain, and I'm going to be talking about purely functional user interfaces. Um, some background about me, uh, I work as a web developer. I build uh, websites for financial products, uh, and we use functional programming for that. Right? So uh, as you can imagine, I have experience building uh, user interfaces with functional programming. So this, is, this talk is like a distillation of my broad experiences building those user interfaces. And uh, I'm gonna, I, 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 one of my aims is to show you uh, existing solutions and how they don't quite match up uh, in my experience, and then show you how we can do things better, right? So this is uh, uh, an overview of what I'm gonna do. Uh, one of the things that I think a lot about is uh, how to make uh, the task of building user interfaces better, right? So you, it's not just purely functional user interfaces, it's about purely functional user interfaces that scale. Right, so let's take a moment to define what scale means here. Uh, the easiest thing to do is to make a solution or a library simple, right? Uh, when you have a problem, you can come up with a simple solution. That's the easy thing to do. But that doesn't always work because uh, when the problem statement changes or your requirements change and they will change at some point, then because your solution was so overfitted to the problem, you end up bumping against the edges of that, right? Uh, or your solution, will work only for some specific use cases, or it will not work when you uh, have a more complex problem in the same uh, vertical slice, but more complex, right? So it doesn't work. So uh, uh, I built a library called Concur uh, that uh, I hope scales properly. So it, uh, you know, you can define it uh, for one specific, sorry. So you can, So you can uh, use it for one specific use case, and I hope to show that it can be, it can adapt easily to changing requirements and changing complexities. So uh, that's what the talk is gonna be about. Uh, basically two parts to the uh, talk, which is an overview of the existing UI landscape and uh, the Concur UI library. Uh, so the, this is the guiding principle behind Concur. Uh, how do you make things scale? Uh, there are basic uh, tool sets that you need to provide to the users of your library. And it's best if those tool sets uh, are uh, minimal. You don't want to have like 10 different tools for 10 different use cases. You want to provide a handful of uh, tools for uh, a lot of different use cases. And uh, they should be orthogonal. So you can combine them, mix and match tools to solve a huge variety of problems. So uh, I've tried to uh, adhere to this principle. I try to remove things from Concur more than add things to it. So uh, yeah. and. Uh, just to give you a, a quick example of scalability, right? So scalability on one end would be that, is it easy to write a hello world program in Concur, right? So this is slightly better than a hello world program. The hello world program in Concur would just be text hello sailor, right? So it's just, you just display some text on the UI. Uh, and this basically wraps it in a button. It's, it's very simple declarative code, right? I hope everyone can understand that. And what it does is it shows a button. Uh, by the way, this entire uh, presentation is a Concur application running on, in my web browser, right? So uh, I can show you live running widgets. Uh, and on the other, not, not really on the other end, but uh, one of the more complex things that you can do is build like a to-do list. That's like the benchmark test for any UI library. So, uh, you, so this, is, this is a running to-do list application where you can add tasks, right? And you can edit them by double clicking, and you can mark them as complete, and you can delete them, and so on. Uh, and you can obviously filter them, but I don't show the code for that. That's also pretty simple, but it's not here. And the entire code to do that, except for the filtering, is literally this, 18 lines, including spaces and everything. And I want to emphasize here that this is idiomatic code. So this is not some fancy HTML code golf kind of a thing, right? So this is how you would normally write applications in Concur. Uh, and that's what I mean when I say it scales. Like to-do list is not a very complex application, right? If you had to define its functionality, you can define it in like a paragraph, right? So the code for it should not be two pages long, right? So that's what Concur tries to do. And obviously, uh, this code will not make a lot of sense to you right now, but hopefully at the end of the talk, it will, right? So, and let's, uh, 
please feel free to ask me any questions anytime because just me going through features and syntax is gonna get boring. So if you have any questions, especially I'm not uh, an expert in things like React or any other user interface libraries. So if you think that you know of a framework that can do things better, just feel free to stop me and tell me and I'll, I'll be happy to know that, right? And I'll try to improve Concur, right? So, okay. So yeah, and uh, if you really wanted to play code golf, this is the same code. You can compress it down to a tweet. I tweeted this out some time back. So you can actually implement to do MVC in a tweet. Uh, and uh, yeah, so let's, let's start with the existing uh, UI uh, uh, landscape. We're, we're gonna go slightly back in time, right? So we, we, uh, we're gonna think about how UI uh, definition is a difficult problem, right? So if you think of UI, uh, it's really two things. Uh, it's a user interface, right? So the user provides some input. Uh, you allow the user to provide some input, usually through some input hardware, right? And you use that input to perform some calculation, which is independent of the user interface. And then you provide feedback to the user generally by drawing lines on some kind of a display device, right? So it's really simple. And if we wanted to just write an API for exactly this, right? Just have a function call to accept input, have a function call to write something to the display, then what would happen, right? So this is how things used to work, right? You had direct access to the direct, uh, to the rendering uh, surface, right? So you can draw a square there, you can write some text there. Uh, and uh, the rendering surface was persistent. So you can write something uh, and it will show up on the display device and then uh, next frame also, unless you change something, the same thing will keep on displaying. So this is a very simple declarative uh, way of handling uh, uh, rendering stuff. Uh, what this doesn't take into account is that, uh, so this is an example, right? So it, uh, it's easy to draw a circle, but it doesn't take into account how you respond to user input or events from outside the system, right? So a simple uh, thing would be that you wanted to animate this circle uh, in a particular direction. So you would have to do something like this. Uh, and the way generally things happen is that you have some kind of a callback where uh, every second the callback will be fired and then you have to update the state of the circle on the screen, right? You have access to the direct rendering interface so you can just change the position of the ball on the screen, right? Uh, some complication arises here because you have to erase the previous position. It's all persistent, right? So uh, you have to erase the previous circle and then you have to draw it in the new place. Uh, and that can get complicated because erasing means replacing it with the background. So you have to keep track of what the background was before you drew a ball on top of the surface. So it gets slightly complicated here. Uh, what people came up with is uh, instead of updating just the position of the ball, at every frame just redraw the entire screen. Right, that's much easier to keep track of, right? And then you have some kind of a state function which keeps track of the position of the circle. So uh, that was called, that, that's basically immediate mode where you have a state uh, with the position of the circle and then every frame you draw the entire background and then the entire, uh, whatever objects you have on screen uh, directly there. So this is immediate mode uh, where you have a rendering function that renders the entire screen in one go, every frame, uh, and you have callbacks that change the state. Right, so this is how it was for quite a long time. Uh, and then people had to complicate it, right? <laughs> so, so they came up with this thing called retain mode. Now why do we need retain mode? So uh, when, when we're thinking about uh, a single circle on the screen, it's very easy. It looks totally uncomplicated. Uh, you don't think that something could go wrong with this. Uh, but what if you had 10 different circles on the screen, all moving in different directions, uh, and you have callbacks changing the positions of arbitrary circles there. Uh, and you, if you wanted to, on every frame, draw all the 10 circles, then you would have to remember the circles that did not change, and then change only the things that did change, right? So you have to keep track of things that did not change also, right? So what retain mode does is that it manages a tree of objects for you, where you can only change the thing that changed, right? And then uh, you can just draw the tree as is. Right, so it's basically an extra layer of state management. And now we're back to the persistent thing that we had earlier, right, where, uh, uh, but this is a higher level thing. This is at the tree level rather than a pixel level. So we're not persisting pixels, we're persisting an entire tree and then you change only one part of the tree and the entire thing can be redrawn every frame, right? So we started with the uh, persistent pixels, we moved on to uh, 
uh, just refreshing the entire set of pixels, and then we're back to persisting trees, just at a high level. So we're moving up in the abstraction, right? So, so that, that's where that most graphic, low-level graphic libraries are. Uh, if you had to do some kind of OpenGL programming or any kind of uh, UI widget programming, you would be in retain mode. You would just populate a button onto the screen and uh, you would be able to interact with it. I mean, you don't have to manage it unless you want to change it, right? So uh, everything is, and especially DOM is retain mode. So you just display some DOM on the screen and then you can change the things that you want to change in response to callback. So retain mode goes a long way, uh, but it has some problems. And th these are the hard problems about UI, where we're finally uh, at a place where, uh, you know, we can think about what the problems are. These are still unsolved, or people are trying to solve them. Uh, no one has the perfect solution for it. Uh, so the biggest problem is reasoning about state transitions. When you have retained uh, mode, uh, and you have, I, I, tell, me, tell me if this sounds buggy to you, right? We have a giant mutable global state variable that gets updated by asynchronous callbacks randomly. Right? I, do, do you think anything could go wrong with that scheme? Right? And that, that's the way we've been building GUIs uh, most of the time. Like, till five or six years ago, everyone did things this way. Right? And I'll tell you what changed uh, like a couple of years ago. Uh, so that's, so reasoning about state transitions. Like, when did my state, my DOM element, change from one state to the other? It's very hard for you to reason about. So that's where bugs come in, right? Uh, and then uh, you also want your, UI definition to be composable. So you want to be able to define uh, some components uh, which are independent, and you can reason about those comp components independently and then compose them together in one big application. So when you have a giant DOM tree, right, how do you separate things, right? So that, that's, a, that's a problem. Uh, some architectures like MVC and all try to solve it. Uh, like jQuery used to be pretty popular, and uh, basically with jQuery you define a component that uh, handles only a part of the tree, uh, the DOM tree, right? And it's responsible for updating it and uh, communicating with other components and things like that, but it was pretty ad hoc. Uh, for example, there wasn't a good story about how do you communicate with other uh, components, right? So it was, you don't know when you're getting something else from some other place, right? So uh, it was very hard to reason about that. And mostly uh, with functional programming, this being functional conf, uh, the biggest problem we have is reasoning about things. Right, so we want to have a system which, even if it's slightly more difficult to use, we want to be able to reason about it so that's much easier to refactor, uh, and we know that there are no bugs with it. So, so then, a couple of years ago, people started coming up with VDOM, right, which is, uh, I think React pioneered it, I'm not really sure if it did, uh, but it came up around the same time, where uh, you basically are back to uh, an, uh, immediate model, like uh, retain mode wasn't working out for us. So we are building an immediate model on top of it where uh, instead of uh, uh, changing things in a mutable shared state, you basically re-render the entire state every time, right? That's what VDOM is. You basically have, a, you think of your uh, entire web page as a giant uh, DOM tree and you re-render it on every frame, right? So it's not exactly every frame, but uh, you can think of it like that on every change, uh, every event that happens. Uh, and uh, React, or virtual DOM, is responsible for making it efficient, right? Because you need retain mode for efficiency. So VDOM allows us to go back to the immediate model. Uh, and I'm gonna argue that the most natural way of writing code is the immediate model, even though most UI libraries use retain mode, right? So uh, Conquer uses something much more similar to an immediate mode uh, of drawing stuff. Any questions so far? I'm gonna move on to, uh, okay. So while writing Conquer, I basically took uh, whatever I thought was great about existing UI libraries, right? So React has only two good things about it, uh, and these are these two things. Uh, and they are functional views, which is basically the imme uh, immediate uh, mode that I just spoke about, where you, uh, a view is basically re-rendered, uh, conceptually at least, on every frame or every event update. So uh, that's called functional views, because uh, you get an event in, 
uh, and then you pre-render your entire uh, view without thinking about the state of the view that was there earlier, right? You just assume that there was, you don't have any shared state or safe state that you need to worry about. So it's a functional view. Uh, and React also has something new, which is component hierarchy, where uh, you basically define a component, uh, let's say foo, and then you can uh, use it inside a larger component, right? So it has a nice way of doing that. Uh, so I'm gonna show you examples of both. So uh, a functional view is basically just this, right? So you uh, have uh, uh, a local state. This is uh, specific to a component, which is the count of how many times the button has been clicked. And then you just render the button every time the count changes, right? So you're re-rendering the entire button. You don't care about what the earlier count was. Every time you render, you basically return this button uh, thing with the new count as the contents, right? So this is a functional view. And then you can see that you attached an event handler that calls this mysterious function called set state, uh, which eventually uh, calls render again. So uh, it triggers render when you do a set state. And then it gets a new count. And then you can have nested components where uh, if you have a class called toolbar, uh, it can basically reuse another uh, component called toolbar item. And it doesn't have to worry about plumbing things, right? You can just use it. Uh, one thing that it does need to care about is that uh, how does communication happen between parent and child? So uh, a toolbar item may need to signal to the toolbar that it has been clicked so that the toolbar can update its state for something. So uh, the way React does it, and there are maybe other ways of doing it, but this is the most functional way of doing it, is that you pass a callback as a prop to the inner child, and then uh, uh, the child is responsible for calling the callback. So it's still callbacks, but it's slightly more principled, right? Uh, and uh, when that callback is called, the parent component is free to do anything it wants, right? And call set state again. So we've seen set state, we've seen callbacks. It's, these are all mysterious functions that uh, are very imperative in nature because uh, what you have is uh, uh, after you call set state, nothing else executes and effectively some global uh, loop takes over and calls your render function again. So your rendering is pure, but your set state and your callbacks are impure, right? So that, that's, that's a big problem with React. Uh, and of course, uh, even though we have minimized state, but we still have local state within a component. So uh, state is not good wherever you use it. So to solve some of those problems, uh, basically uh, there's this uh, language called Elm. How many people are familiar with Elm or have heard of it? Okay, quite a few, that, that's good. So uh, the selling point of Elm, of course, is that it's a pure functional programming language, right? With types, strong types, algebraic data types, right? So uh, that's, that's the best part about Elm. But another thing that it improves on the React model, uh, it still has a virtual DOM, but what it does is it uh, reifies the actual action that gets sent. So your uh, view uh, now does not call this mysterious set state function, it instead returns a data type that represents the action you're supposed to take, right? So uh, in case of uh, our previous example where we had a button which gets, uh, which shows a number which gets incremented every time you run it, uh, what the view can do is that it can return an increment data type. Is this syntax clear to everyone? Uh, I was hoping that it's not uh, very complicated even for people not familiar with Elm. So this is the view at the top where it shows a button. And again, we have an on-click event handler, but it, instead of uh, calling set state, it specifically calls increment uh, and passes it down an address, which is like a pipe, right? So it's not calling a mysterious imperative function, it's doing something specific. Uh, and then you have an update function that is a pure way of uh, managing your state. So uh, the update function gets called automatically. So there's still some magic happening in the background. Right, uh, but the update function, what it does is it takes the action that was uh, passed by the view, and then it in, uh, changes your model in response. Right, so you have two pieces of functional uh, components there, and uh, the plumbing between them is still uh, a bit of a magic. But uh, uh, what this allows us to do is reason about the state of state transitions, right? Because uh, every state transition will happen through the update function, uh, and it will be through a specific concrete action data type. 
So you can inspect all of them. You can see what components and what action data type at what point of time. Um, this allows us to do uh, cool things like uh, undo, redo, uh, debugging, you know, those things. I'm not going to go into that, but there are some videos and stuff on the web. But yeah, so this is the uh, this is why we use Elm. Uh, and again, these are the good things about Elm. So they are in Concur as well, right? So Concur is uh, based on functional programming languages. It has strong uh, types, algebraic data types, immutable data structures, uh, and uh, we use all of them. Uh, some of the problems with Elm are, apart from the one that I just said, which is that there are some magic bits to Elm, is that uh, it's crippled. So it's a functional programming language, but it doesn't have some of the better parts of functional programming languages, like type classes. Uh, it doesn't have monads. I don't know if that's a positive or a negative. But <laughs> it doesn't, so uh, you, know, you run into the lack of these uh, pretty quickly. So it doesn't scale, right? It's the same scalability problem if you're building a complex application. Uh, you have to do a lot of plumbing. There's a lot of boilerplate to work around the lack of these things. Like state monad is a, a great way to manage state, and Elm can't use it. So uh, uh, Conquer allows state monad. Conquer does this, but better because it has monads. Right, I'm going to show you. OK, finally, uh, instead of virtual DOM, there's another way of solving this problem. And there are probably more ways that are out there that I don't know about. Uh, is uh, FRP, which is functional reactive programming, right? How many people have heard of functional reactive programming? Okay, great. How many people have worked with some form of functional reactive programming? Oh, still quite a few. Okay, I'm I'm happy about that. Okay, great. So uh, with FRP, basically what you do is uh, you have retain mode, right? Which is uh, a huge ball of mutable state, right? And you want to be able to reason about the transitions that that state takes place, right? So uh, one way to do it is ignore the transitions, do what Elm and uh, React do, which is just re-render the entire state every time. Uh, what FRP does is that it lets you create a graph with explicit dependencies between parts of the state, right? Uh, and it has concepts of time-varying values, uh, which are called events and behaviors. Uh, and it allows you to combine those time-varying values uh, in different ways and then plug them into uh, the graph, right? So for example, a simple example, actually I'm going to show you an example later on, so, uh, but the concept is that you create a graph and then you just let it run, okay? Uh, so you're kind of punting on uh, how do you uh, manage those state transitions because you manage the graph and that is your logic and then you don't care about the state transitions, right? So it's like a higher level uh, way of working with state transitions. Uh, one of the uh, FRP libraries called Reflex that I've used in Haskell, it also uses monadic layout, which uh, for some use cases is pretty great. So it allows you to uh, render uh, components, uh, compose components together uh, using monads. Uh, but it has some problems that I'm gonna show you. So yeah, so this, these are uh, the FRP primitives. Uh, basically you have events, which are things that take place uh, in discrete points of time. So you have, uh, for example, button clicks. So a button click will op only happen at some specific points uh, in time. And then you have behaviors, which are things which always have a value at any point of time, right? So for example, system time. You can ask for the current system time at any point. So these, these are two primitives that you have. And then you can combine them uh, using combinators. So this is just a sample of the combinators we have. You can convert an event to a behavior, right? So how uh, can anyone take a guess at how would you convert an event to a behavior? So if you have, uh, for example, a button click, right, which only happens at some point of time, and you wanted to get a continuous value out of that, right? So how, how would you do that? Right, but uh, so the problem here is uh, what should, at the time that event, the event fires, then you have a value. But what about the times that the event is not firing? So you need some kind of a default value uh, to start with because the event has not currently fired, right? So uh, uh, hold is a way to convert from a, an event to a behavior. What it does is it takes a default value. That's the starting value. At the time you call hold, this is the default value that the behavior is gonna have. Uh, and then whenever that event fires, it basically updates the value that uh, is uh, returned by the behavior. 
So it's a very logical way of composing things, right? So you can convert an event to a behavior, you can convert a behavior to an event, and it's appropriately called sample. Uh, basically, you can think of it as sampling uh, a behavior which has a value at all points, uh, and you sample it at some specific intervals, and you get the value there, right? So uh, it requires uh, an event uh, also, because that event, the second event, event B here, uh, represents the points at which you want to sample, right? So it's, it's a way of composing behaviors and events together. So you have a behavior which is, think of it like a graph with uh, a continuous line on it, right? So that represents a behavior. And then at specific intervals that this event fires that you've passed, and then a uh, sample will just plug the values out of that behavior at those specific intervals. And it returns like this tuple of the value of the event. Just so we don't lose any information, it returns the value of the event also, which is B, and it returns the value of the behavior at that particular point of time. So, oh, I probably should have mentioned an event A is basically an event that has a value of type A, okay? So uh, A could be, for example, an in integer or a string or any type, right? Uh, same with behavior. Behavior is uh, a behavior of type A, right? So you can compose things like that and then you can combine multiple events together. So you've, if you have two buttons uh, and you have events that represent each of their clicks, you can join them together. So now you have an event that fires every time any of the buttons is clicked, right? So you can combine them together like that. Similarly, you can combine behaviors. Um, and this is how you would use it. So if I wanted to have uh, a button that, a button and some text, uh, and the text gets updated to from not click to click every time you click the button, right? So this is how you would implement it. So uh, this is do notation. How many people know about do notation? Okay less than I had hoped. <laughs> so do notation is like imperative programming, right? But this is in functional programming languages. So uh, what you have is basically you have uh, uh, a do block, uh, which is like begin and end, or you can think of as a function body. Uh, and then it does these things sequentially. So here it's creating a button and getting the event uh, out of it called clicks. Now this event fires every time the button gets clicked. Uh, and then it's creating a text uh, but the value of the text is uh, a behavior because think about when you want to display something on the screen, you need something to be displayed at every point of time, right? It's not that it should appear only at certain intervals, right? So a text uh, takes a behavior of string, right? So you pass it a behavior of string and it takes the responsibility of keeping the text uh, label updated with the value of the behavior. So the way this thing works is that uh, it shows a default value of not click. As I said, hold takes a default value. Uh, so the default value is not click. But then it converts, uh, it takes an event uh, called clicks, uh, and then it converts that to a behavior. So every time that event fires, it basically updates the value uh, to whatever value was returned by that event. Now, uh, clicks does not return any useful value because a button click, yes. Clicks, yes, exactly. Yeah. 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 Oh, no. So, so these are lifted values. These are not primitive values. Yes, it does, but you need to lift it. So you can say lift unit, right? So it will lift it into an event. It's not really lift. I don't know exactly what that function is called. Right, but there's a function to lift it. Oh, you mean if I replace clicks with something else? Yeah. Oh, but what's important is the time at which it fires. So if you re replace the clicks call here entirely, then you've, you've basically broken the connection. So it, it will never know what uh, time uh, the click was done, right? So. Yes, exactly, exactly, exactly. So you have a, uh, a sequential set of statements. Each statement can potentially create uh, a UI element and get some events or behaviors out of it. Uh, and these are basically time-varying values, right? So 
Uh, and then you can use this time varying values. You can compose different time varying values together and then pass it to a different widget uh, that uses it to display its contents, right? And that's how you build a graph basically uh, with uh, FRP. Uh, another thing here uh, is that uh, clicks does not have a useful value. So we basically map over all the values that clicks, re click, uh, clicks returns. So instead of returning unit, which is like a useless value, we return a string called click, right? So this is this syntax. Uh, it basically is an anonymous function here, which takes, uh, uh, which says that I don't care about what values returned by clicks. I just want to, uh, I always want to return uh, the string click, right? So, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a short introduction to how FRP works, right? Uh, basically, uh, you create this uh, graph and uh, this is like a high level description of what should happen and then you just let it run, right? Uh, the good things about FRP are that it gives us the concept of returning things from widgets, right? So a button returns uh, a time varying value that represents whenever it's clicked. Uh, Text does not have a useful return value because it's just a label, doesn't really do anything. But potentially it could also have a click handler if you're in a web page or something. So it could also return an event. So that's one of the things that's in Concur also. You can return values from widgets. Uh, and the other thing is that all of these widgets are functors. So you can map over time varying values, right? So you basically are, uh, you can change the value that is returned by a, uh, an event or a behavior uh, or a widget. So those are two things that are in Concur as well. Uh, the problems with the FRP is that it's slightly more complicated, right? I'm sure lots of people here did not understand that uh, sample of code. Uh, so it's difficult for new people to get started with. Uh, and it also uh, turns out that it has, uh, in my experience, an unpredictable complexity curve. So uh, I've built like large applications with the uh, Reflex uh, uh, and I was just getting started with it. So it might be, some of it might be my inexperience, but uh, if what would happen is that if you want to refactor some things, then suddenly from a simple piece of code, it will become very complex. So it's not a linear curve. It's very unpredictable. In some places it's linear, some places it's exponential. Uh, and it's hard to know when that will happen. Uh, and then uh, it uses monadic layout uh, for, uh, it uses monads for layout, which is I think an oversight. Uh, mo uh, layout is not monoidal, uh, it's not monadic, it's monoidal. So basically uh, layout is a way of composing multiple elements on the screen together uh, and monads should not figure into it. You should be able to take a widget, take another widget and put them on the screen together without thinking about monads, right? So it uses monads for widget composition, which I think is complicated and it has problems. Uh, and the place where it should provide a monad, it does not. So monads are good for sequencing things. Uh, so state transitions should be monadic but it does not have a monad for that. It instead uses those time varying values that I spoke about. Uh, it does not have composable widgets. You can compose events and behaviors together, but not widgets, uh, which is a problem. Uh, and if you have a lot of nested stuff, then sometimes it becomes too complicated, right? So, which I uh, already spoke about, but. So yeah, so let's come to Concur. It's open source, so you can get it at GitHub, right? And uh, it's also, uh, it's, this particular version is written in Haskell, but I also ported it to PureScript, and there's also a JavaScript version. You can find all of them there. There are links uh, on this page. Uh, so, in building Concur, I only used the freshest ingredients that I could think of. Concur is pretty new. It's only a couple of months old, right? So I would love feedback on this. Uh, but basically, it's a strongly typed functional language. So PureScript and Haskell both are uh, great for this. Uh, it's a DSL for functional views. It really builds upon React's functional views, uses virtual DOM, uh, and uh, it takes that and builds upon that. It has components, uh, but it does not have mutable state. Uh, it has no callbacks. Uh, everything, communication between widgets happens not through callbacks, but through a monad, right? So it's a sequential way of uh, getting things out of a widget and passing it to another widget. Uh, and I'm gonna show you examples of that. So no callbacks means that it's much easier to reason about. And it has three variants right now, and I'm 
always thinking of porting it to more languages. The JavaScript one, obviously it's not a pure functional programming language, but I think the JavaScript version also worked out great. Uh, it uses async generators. Uh, so yeah, so uh, I mentioned earlier that we want to do things uh, with as few tool tools as possible and those tools should be orthogonal. So there are only two things that you need to know about in order to use Concur. You don't need to know about monads to use Concur, right? So th there are just two things, which is when you compose widgets together, uh, they are monoidal in the sense that you can append two things together, right? That's, that's it. Uh, and then when you uh, do a transition, so it's monadic, but if what that effectively means is that it's, it's sequential, right? So you basically compose widgets to create a view and then you trans, uh, you transition to another uh, view which has again composed widgets in it, right? So that's the model you need to keep in mind and this simple model goes a long way, right? Uh, from simple applications to very complex applications. Uh, so a widget basically is uh, uh, a very generic thing. It uh, can have different types of views. Uh, typically we'll use HTML for web views, uh, but I envisioned uh, Concur can be used for desktop applications or uh, it can also do server side rendering. So then you won't have HTML. Uh, you would rather uh, generate a string that has the HTML content in it. So you can change the view depending on what backend you're using. Uh, right now there are two backends. One is React based and one is uh, Virtual DOM based without React. Uh, both of them use HTML as the view. Uh, and then a widget needs to have a return type. As I mentioned with FRP, you have things returning from a widget, uh, but these are not time varying values, these are the values themselves. So a button in uh, Concur uh, has unit as the return value, but it fires only once effectively, right? So the button gets clicked and then it returns a unit. That's what really happens. Uh, and then it has a simple DSL for uh, uh, DOM uh, elements. So uh, text label would just be uh, it takes a string and then it displays a text label uh, on the web page. As I already showed you in the hello world example, uh, this is the hello world of Concur. Uh, and then you can nest it together using uh, arrays. You can see that uh, it's, w lists are great for appending things together. So if you have two lists with some arbitrary widgets, you can append them together in a larger list. So that's why I use lists for uh, DOM elements. So here you have a div, uh, with some properties, uh, it has a class called header. Uh, and then I have a list of widgets that go inside that div. And to create this list of children, you can use uh, list append, right? So you can get children from two different places and append them together. That's, that's the point of uh, monoidal uh, layout. And uh, you can wrap things together. Uh, so as I showed you, uh, the div here wraps two uh, text widgets. Each of these is separate independent widget. Uh, and then you can take the text widget and put it inside a button uh, and you can get this button. If you wanted to put two buttons, then again, you can wrap them inside a div uh, and you have two buttons uh, just like that. So it's a very simple DSL for creating HTML uh, and you can have two buttons here like that. If you wanted to compose them vertically, then you can basically wrap them individually inside div. So what I wanna show here is that you can nest it as deep as you want. It's just simple. Uh, uh, HTML uh, and uh, till that point it's fairly similar to React uh, but it does event handling in a different manner so it's not really set state and callbacks. The way it does it is that uh, every widget and again this is similar to FRP, uh, do notation, you have things that happen in the sequence, you have a button and a text, right? Uh, but what the button does is that uh, when it gets clicked, effectively the button disappears from the view, right, uh, in Concur. And then whatever happens, whatever widget is next in the sequence, that gets displayed. So this does a fundamentally different thing from the FRP example. Even though the structure is the same, you have a button and then a text, right? But with Concur, uh, the sequencing is used for transitions between widgets. So you can show a button and then as soon as the button emits an event, you move to a text label display, right? This is pretty fundamental to Concur, so uh, is there anyone who would like me to explain this more? I'll, I'll come to that, yeah. So, uh, yeah, but if you don't want the first thing to persist, you can just move on to another uh, widget.
right? Yes. Oh. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yes, exactly. Right. Yes. Yes, exactly. So I'm going to answer both, right? So the same concepts uh, apply to different kinds of events also with different data types, uh, return types. So yeah, it's, it's in one of the following slides. Yes. Okay. Okay. So uh, yeah. So uh, okay. So. Uh, what you have is this sequential uh, widget composition and uh, the way this widget composition works is that anytime an event fires, the entire widget disappears, the new widget comes in and that works uh, in a nested format also. So if you have a div that has a button inside it, as soon as the button fires, the entire div disappears, right? If, so the entire UI that's nested uh, around that event handler, the entire thing disappears, which seems kind of strange, right? But uh, so if, uh, if I have a button and I click on it, the button disappeared uh, and it showed a text and a button. Now the button was inside a div. I click on it, the entire text and the button both disappeared and we came back. Uh, this also shows another feature where you have combinators like forever, which basically don't let this entire thing end. It just keeps on running it again and again, right? So after the second widget ends, it just goes back to the first one again. It's like a loop, right? So you can, these are very easy to define. You can define them yourself. Uh, so that, that's the event model with Concur. Uh, the other thing that it does is that uh, while you're transitioning from one view to the other view, that's a great place to have effects. So Concur has great effects support. You can do things like uh, log stuff, you can use it for debugging, uh, you can use it for uh, uh, bindings to another JavaScript library, for example. Uh, FRP is not that great for bindings because uh, uh, you don't have a clear sense of transition. You basically build a graph and then you let it run so you don't manage the transitions yourself. Uh, and uh, with Concur, there are specific places where you have those uh, trans uh, transitions so you can put effects there. It doesn't affect anything in the view. So this is how you would define forever. It's basically just uh, given a widget, it runs the widget and then when it ends, it just calls itself again. It's like a tail call, right? So you don't need to understand the syntax completely but uh, these combinators are very easy to define. Uh, so this was your question, right? So if you have uh, multiple buttons with different data types, here is the same data type, but I'm returning different values. Uh, and the way I'm returning different values is I'm, this dollar syntax is basically mapping over the uh, event that gets returned, right? So this basically has uh, two buttons uh, with the event handlers for each, right? When the button gets clicked uh, and Button event handlers generally return unit, which is no useful value. But I'm using the mapping to return hello from the first one, namaste from the second one, right? So to answer your question, if you have two different data types, you would map over them to make them the same data type. You would, so if you have like int and string, you would probably put an either on top, so you have left int, right string, right? To make it the same data type. So, uh, and that has to be done only in this specific place and then you can, take it out and then remove the wrapping. So you, the rest of the code doesn't have to deal with that wrapping. And this shows that the widget itself is also can be mapped over and the event handler itself can be mapped over. So there's a subtle change here. Uh, here I'm uh, returning hello from the event handler and here I'm returning hello from the entire widget. It's the same thing. It does the same thing, right? So what it does is if you click on hello, it says hello sailor. If you click on Namaste, it says Namaste Sailor, right? So that, that's how you define it. <laughs> so yeah, I'm gonna skip over that. Uh, okay, so this is a good example of what you said where you have an on-change and you have an on-focus, two separate event handlers. They return different things because on-change has to return the changed value of the text. Uh, on-focus just says that it's focus, so it's unit. Uh, and I wrap it in, uh, data structure that abstracts over the differences, right? So, uh, change returns a string and focus doesn't return anything useful. Uh, this concurs model is generic enough to implement 
Elm architecture in it, which is very simple. So uh, basically you define your state uh, the way it is and you define your action data type just like in Elm. Uh, and then you, when you compose the widgets together, you're basically doing it using concurs model, but the first part uh, displays the entire view with the event handlers. Uh, this is like Elm's view function. And as soon as any event handlers within this uh, fires, the entire view gets removed from the view, right, from the web page. So, th but then you have the value of that event handler with you, which is like the action uh, from Elm's model. And then you can use the action to update your state and call itself again. So here I'm, so I use the action, uh, whether it was, whether you clicked on the remember me checkbox or you clicked on uh, some text box or did whatever. And then I call the same widget again uh, with a different set of parameters to represent that change in state. So this is effectively Elm's uh, model. Uh, and since it uses virtual DOM, which is the same thing as Elm, so it uh, boils down to the same thing in the application. And this is what it comes down to. Uh, I can, every time I type something, it fires an event, uh, but then uh, it changes the value of the text box, right? Uh, but it doesn't end the entire ap uh, application. So this was your question, right? So you want a persistent checkbox uh, and text uh, widget there. So how do you do that? So every time this event fires and it's about to be removed, I just call the same widget again with the same parameters and it just gets displayed again. And React makes it so, a virtual DOM makes it so that you don't see the transition, right? So it just calls the same widget again with a different value of the text box and it displays that. Uh, only when I click on submit does it actually end and update the text on top, right? So it doesn't update it every time I type something here, but it updates it every time I click on submit, right? So these applications are easy to build. Uh, with the uh, uh, concur. And then th because it's a monad, you get like cool things like what if you wanted to show a list of forms and uh, get all their values out in an array. Uh, and this is sequentially. So you should form one, get the value out, form two, get the value out, and so on till the very end. And then at the end, you want a list of all the values that came out. So that's simply traverse. Uh, so you traverse over a widget and you get that behavior, right? So you've, this scales, right? So this is the scalability thing, right? So you can use whatever monadic combinators you want to use and it'll just work, right? So persistent widgets, I also have another solution called signals, which is like poor man's FRP, right? I'm just gonna take two minutes to quickly go over that. Basically, a signal is an abstraction over a widget. And again, this is implemented in like half a page of code, right? So it's not very complicated uh, on top of widgets. But basically, it's a widget that uh, recursively calls itself. It's a forever looping widget. And then signals provide a way to compose forever looping widgets together, right? So how much time do I have to? Okay, perfect, okay. <laughs> okay, so I'm, I'm almost done with most of my stuff, but uh, I leave some time for questions after that. So yeah, so with signals, you can write uh, very similar code as uh, what we had earlier. Uh, but now it's a signal and all these uh, divs and buttons, all those combinators that you've defined, I made them all generic. So they can be interpreted as signals or widgets, right? You just write them and depending on the type signature, it does the right thing, right? It makes them a signal or it makes them a widget, right? So you don't have to change your code. Uh, but now what has happened is that every time you click on a button, it doesn't disappear from the view, right? Because it's a signal, it's a forever running widget. Uh, one good thing it has over FRP is that the return value from a signal is not a time varying value, it's a normal value, right? So you can, you don't have to deal with the complexity of joining events together, joining behaviors and events and doing those things. You can basically get a value out and then you can do, pass it to another text uh, label there and it just works regularly, right? You can just, uh, you can have an effect that logs it as string and it'll just work. Okay, so yeah, signals compose just like a regular uh, monadic thing. So here I'm, I have that hello widget, I can run it twice, and both of them will be on the screen at the same time, because this is, this basically gives you what FRP gives you, uh, and uh, it gives you that mono, monadic uh, uh, layout, which has its own problems, so signals have the same problems. So, but we also provide widgets to get over those. Uh, and then signals can be easily converted to a widget by just calling dine. There's a, function called dine and it becomes a widget now. It's all magic, right? So, <laughs> and then uh, what if you traverse over all signals instead of traversing over all widgets? 
So because signals are persistent, when you traverse uh, over a form, let's say, uh, 100 times, it will show 100 forms in the same page. And then you can fill all of them, and then when you submit all of them, it will show you the result as an array. Right, so signals have different semantics, but it's the same code. The same code works for both signals and widgets. That's all I had. Uh, I wanted to show you some live code. Like this uh, uh, slide deck is written in Conquer. I can change code right now, and it just immediately changes. So, you know, but unfortunately, we don't, we don't have a lot of time. So, <laughs> any any questions uh, that I can answer? No. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you very much.